Well, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, seminar. I know that it's um, like not on the topic of the day, which is COVID-19. I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at the end of the uh, seminar and some other things that might be happening, but uh, we're going to press ahead with um, the, uh, the topic of today, which is phage control in the dairy processing industry. Um, uh, just want to thank uh, Dairy Australia for giving um, us this opportunity to be able to share this uh, technology. And um, I do want to say that it's a pretty hard gig because uh, those of you from the dairy industry will know what the other name for phage is, um, which is of course virus. And uh, trying to uh, encourage people to use a virus in today's sort of environment is somewhat tricky, but um, I'm sure none of you are just uh, casually interested in the dairy industry. And I'm sure you understand the difference between a virus that can infect a human and one that's specifically targeted for bacteria. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, don't come from a food and dairy background. Um, I come from uh, like a family that um, has been involved in agriculture for many years. Um, we have a family farm down near Lee and Gatha in Victoria on the Grand Ridge Road, uh, very close to the Saputo plant down there. Um, and uh, we, we do beef cattle and uh, potatoes and we have done dairy in previous generations down there. Um, I, um, I, I uh, also do a little bit of work with um, the Defence Force and a few other organisations. Um, my role is uh, the managing director of Sunny Clean Group. So, uh, yeah, I manage a team of a few hundred um, managers and then uh, many more hundreds of staff around Australia. And we um, we look after the hygiene requirements of the food manufacturing industry. So everything from beverage to dairy um, to um, you know, red meat, chicken, and everything else. Anything that's food or um, beverage, uh, we're in, and we, we do that all around Australia. So at the moment, it's actually quite a full on job. Usually it's a little bit more relaxed when I can sort of work with my area managers and operations managers. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and SKG is a, a Sunny Clean Group is a mixture of um, a few different companies that I purchased and merged together over the last few years. But together, the companies have over 60 years of operating um, in the food and beverage industry, solely looking at hygiene. So we also do offices and things like that, but only if they're attached to a food and beverage industry facility, uh, which is why you know we, we haven't strayed far from where we, we started. Um, as, as I said, I'm speaking about phages today. Um, phages are an emerging technology and um, the company that we work with, the company that um, we uh, do our research with and we have a stake in is uh, PhageGuard or Microos. And uh, Microos, uh, PhageGuard is one of their products. Um, they are basically set up to develop phages for human health. And whilst they were doing that, you can see on your screen there that um, they've got some skincare creams already that incorporate uh, endolysin, which is a product of a byproduct of the phage lytic cycle. Um, they basically came across and discovered um, phage guard L or Listex and phage guard S or Salmonella X. Um, and they realized that, that those particular products um, are just incredibly powerful tools in the food manufacturing industry, and which is what I'll be speaking about today. Um, this isn't the type of technology that's been used to. Um, put into food without some level of academic rigor. So you can see the institutions on your screen now. We've worked with all of these and actually many more. And now uh, the, the, the body of academic research is enormous, unlike any other product. This isn't like a practical approach to uh, food hygiene. This is definitely comes from the academic side of things, from deep scientific research, peer reviewed, uh, like a long history and train of academic papers. They're all available on the uh, PhageGuard website. And if you really want to get into it, you can download them and read them. If you're working from home, you might have some more time, I don't know. But um, the, this, this particular subject is deeply rooted in academic research. Um, I'll just give you a few basic um, uh, overview of, of what I'm talking about. So phages or viruses uh, were first discovered in uh, 1915 to 17. Um, they were discovered because they were uh, they were killing um, uh, they were killing bacteria that were on soldiers who were injured in the Second World War, and um, 
the, the, the word phage um, comes from the Greek word to eat because they eat the bacteria. Um, so these phages attack the bacteria. Back when uh, they were discovered, they weren't actually visible. We didn't have the microscopes available to see them, but obviously now we can see them. Um, they're just super prolific. If you're worried about in introducing phages into your environment, then you'd need to be on another planet that's been bombarded by UVC radiation for that even to be an issue, because there are so many phages uh, around. So like ridiculous statistics, like every 48 hours, up to 50% of the bacterial population is killed by phages. Like that is incredible. That's an incredible thing. Um, up to a hundred times smaller than a bacteria and like bacteria aren't particularly large um, and they're, they're much more prolific than bacteria and they're harmless except to their specific bacteria, except to their specific host. So phage guard L, which is full of um, a particular phage that attacks Listeria, will have no effect against phage guard, uh, sorry, against a Salmonella bacteria or an E. coli bacteria or any other bacteria. So they're super, super targeted. They're, if, if our quaternary ammoniums and the other things that we use to sanitize our food manufacturing plants were um, like a carpet bomb, then the phage guard is like a guided missile that will only hit a specific target. And if it doesn't hit that target, it just denatures and disappears into the environment. So it will not, um, there's no collateral damage with phage guard. Phages are super highly targeted. Uh, and before we just go on to the next thing, that, that's actually really important for the food industry because they're so targeted, they don't cause things like taste uh, issues. They don't cause uh, uh, any food spoilage issues. They won't attack other other elements of your um, of your production chain. They won't damage any equipment. They don't. They don't. They're not bioaccumulative. They don't. There's, there's no other issues, which is why we were able to get them uh, registered as a food processing aid uh, with Fazant, Food Safety Australia, New Zealand. So these are literally used the same as water in your plant. Like you don't actually have to list them as an ingredient. They're just a food processing aid. Um, they're very targeted and very specific. Um, yeah, obviously the most abundant microorganisms on earth. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is, gets a little bit gruesome, but like I've got it there on the screen, so I might as well just go into it. Um, we'll just go with the second dot point. We'll avoid the third. One milliliter of seawater contains up to one billion phages. That's a staggering thing. So if you've ever been down the ocean, perhaps when you're a kid and got dunked by a wave and swallowed a bit of seawater, if you swallowed one milliliter of seawater in your life, then you have consumed up to a billion phages. The human gut contains as many as 10 to the power of 15 phages. And for those scientists out there, you'll know just how incredibly large that is. I actually haven't got them with me, but over in our uh, like display cabinet over there, I have little bottles of phage guard. It's about this big. They contain around 12 trillion phages in those little bottles. And uh, they're just ultra prolific around the earth. Um, as any bacteria, they have a cycle, and I'll just explain that here. Um, so we've obviously got uh, absorption. So they come in contact with the bacterial cell, then they infect the bacteria. Little guy at number two there is inserting, um, I suppose they're not gendered actually, and they're not uh, actually living because they're just viruses, but you can understand why, um, why people associate them with a living thing because they behave the way they do. But that's particular virus is injecting its DNA into the bacteria. Now, inside the bacteria, um, the DNA of the code is forcing that particular bacteria to make copies of that particular phage inside the bacteria. Uh, then um, they're becoming uh, mature phages and they're ready, they've, all, they've all assembled the different parts, including the replicated DNA. And then they uh, break out and then the whole cycle starts again. Now the lytic cycle is something that we don't actually rely on um, to, to have an effect in customer products. Because if you're having a lytic cycle, that means that there's enough of those particular bacterial cells to keep jumping from one to the other. 
And of course, our goal is to never have enough bacteria, especially Listeria or Salmonella, in your food or on your facility to ever have to do a lytic cycle, which is why we use uh, like regular doses of phage guard, whether it's environmental, food contact or on food, so that it can knock out instantly any, um, any uh, bacterial issues. If we, if we waited for the lytic cycle, you'd have to have enough bacteria on site to maintain that, and no one wants to have enough bacteria on site to maintain a, um, a lytic cycle. So it's not something we um, particularly go for. Let me just check the time, make sure, oh, heaps of time, good. Um, this is just a picture. This is something that when they discovered phages, they never knew and they could never see this. But um, you're, um, you're actually looking at uh, uh, viruses or the phages in infecting a bacteria under an electron scanning microscope. That's been artificially coloured. I don't know why they're green, but we don't really know what colour they are. They're probably definitely not green. Uh, as much as we like to think of them as being alive, because they've got those cute little legs on them or potentially evil, deadly looking legs on them, we think that they can sort of crawl around. Obviously, they're not actually legs. Um, which means that they can't move around. They just move in solution. So, you know, if you don't have enough of them in solution, then they're just not going to interact. If you look over on the right of the screen there, you see there's one phage left with three bacteria. It's not doing anything because it's not coming in contact. It can't see the bacteria and then crawl over to it. It's not actually a bug. Um, it, it's not technically alive. So it just comes in contact and then reacts. And if it doesn't come in contact, it doesn't. So we have to make sure that the concentrations of phage are at a certain level so that they do come in contact enough with the bacteria. Um, of course, it helps when you have massively high concentrations of phage to start with, like billions of them in a 100 mil bottle, um, which means we can um, dilute them and they become, you know, still very virulent even uh, after they've been diluted. Um, we have currently got um, four target bacteria that are commercialised. Only two of these have Fizant's registration in Australia, and they are, and I'm sure you'd be happy to hear this, Listeria and Salmonella. Um, we pick those as the two most important target species bacteria in Australia, and we put them through the registration with Fizant's. And believe me, putting Salmonella phages and listeria phages through um, Fizant's and getting them registered as a food processing aid was not a small task. A lot of people raised their eyebrows when we told them we wanted to spray food with live virus uh, and we had to convince them that um, the, the live virus was safe and we didn't really have to convince them because there's such a huge body of academic research out there into exactly what phages do and how they behave that um, we eventually won the day and they are registered and they are being used. And I can see, the, I won't name anyone, but I can see the list of people who have registered for this uh, seminar. And I know that some of you, uh, in fact, a lot of you are actually using this product already. Most of you are using it for Listeria and then starting to look at using it for Salmonella and uh, in, in terms of suppression. And uh, I believe most of the time it's being used environmentally due to the the volumes that we're sending out, smaller volumes generally for environmentally, but obviously it has the capacity with Fizant's registration to be used on food. The E. coli and Campobacter are in, um, uh, do exist, the product does exist. It's not registered with Fizant's in Australia yet. So we'd have to have a customer that would, was interested enough to actually bother registering it because it's an extremely expensive process and arduous to go through uh, if there's no end user. And we also have 50 or 60 other target bacteria that are being looked into at and they're at different stages. And yes, they do include food spoilage bacteria. And we could potentially in the future come up with a cocktail where we have a cocktail of phages um, that takes out all of the bad guys and most of the food spoilage bacteria, which would be a way of making um, dairy products and other food products uh, life, shelf life expectancy extend dramatically, especially since unlike other uh, food spoilage bacteria killing devices, they actually remain active as long as there's a moisture environment. 
so they could live on the product and if somehow it was reinfected with a salmonella or an e coli or a listeria or it popped up out of the product somehow it would be there ready to kill go through the lytic cycle and leave copies of itself on the food just in case um, there was any further issues so that's where the technology is going um, let alone human health which is not part of the scope of this um, of this webinar okay ah. Push the button and nothing happened. It's definitely not the end of my presentation, so we'll just keep going over here. Here we go. Here we go. So um, there's three particular zones that we need to be aware of. The first zone is food. There are some uh, companies using it on food in Australia, so literally spraying it directly on food. A good example of that outside of your industry is just spraying it directly on smoked salmon. Smoked salmon, every, every salmon plant in Australia has to deal with the fact that salmon are involved in their production line, just like all of you have to deal with milk. Um, and salmon come in from the ocean and the ocean actually has listeria in it. And uh, so the salmon coming in to the production facility have listeria on them. So there's a continual stream of listeria coming into salmon production facilities and they need to work on that. So um, many salmon pro uh, producing facilities around the world are now spraying their final product with phage guard, just a little bit of a spray inside the packet to keep, to keep guard. Um, there are some companies in Australia, none of them listed here I can see, um, that are using that for soft cheeses as well. Obviously soft cheeses is always a concern when it comes to listeria. So they're putting a little spray of this inside the packet before it gets um, heat sealed and, and shrunk around the, the cheese. And which means that it just hangs out around the, the cheese. And if there's any listeria, it'll infect the listeria and then go through a lytic cycle, uh, rendering that listeria um, null and void and then just leaving a whole bunch more copies of itself uh, around on the um on the on the cheese or whatever product it is then we have the food contact surfaces so this is things like stainless steel machines um you know look production facilities walls floors all that sort of sorry not walls and floors um we're talking about food contact surfaces. So anywhere where the food contacts on your machinery, um, these are places where um, bacterial films can for form. Often um, bacterial form films form because of the cleaning behavior that's been going on over the years where um, the, um, the, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the stainless steel has been pitted and it has little microscopic grooves in it, which is a, like a bac bacteria hotel essentially and uh, that means that it's very difficult to remove these bacterial films um, and uh, obviously our product penetrates straight through those bacterial films and will kill the underlying bacteria uh, if it's of the target species um, and then of course we've got environment which does include walls and floors and roofs and all those sort of places you don't get to very often um, that, that are put on a periodic cleaning schedule so this could be used for instance in drains um, Literally just put in a backpack you buy from Bunnings, uh, mix it with a couple of litres of water and just spray it down the drain. Even though it's one of the most high tech, biologically, like forefront, cutting edge, all those buzzwords type products you can find, you can still just put it in a couple of litres of water and spray it down the drain and it kills a listeria that might be hiding in your drain. Not that any dairy facilities have listeria hiding in their drains. Um, benefits of phage guard. Um, now this is, um, I mean, this sounds like a little bit of a marketing thing. I guess this presentation like had its genesis in a like a like me trying to sell it. And to be honest, we don't really have many competitors. There's there was an American company that was selling phage concoctions, but they were having trouble maintaining their titer or their level of potency. Um, and I would imagine there'll be other companies that'll come online at some point that'll sell similar products. But Let's just say the benefits of phage technology. Um, it's about their log reductions in food. So we basically we want massive log reductions um, on food and also on biofilms in the food processing equipment. Uh, it's actually effective against all listeria species. If it isn't effective against a particular species, which would be evidenced by swab testing, um, the particular batch um, is noted and the next batch incorporates that particular listeria bacteria. In fact, we have a plant that shall remain nameless that was using this product and it wasn't particularly killing what they were getting back as a form of Welsh Mary listeria. 
And um, it wasn't in Victoria, but it was in another state. I won't go any further than that. Um, and um, this particular Welsh Mary bacteria was not being killed by the phage guard, uh, Listex. And um, we actually had a look into it and it was a different variant that hadn't been found before at all. So um, the people at phage guard incorporated it into, um, into the mix and now it is effective against that particular strain. And uh, the, uh, the company wanted to name, like the, the plant manager wanted to name the particular type of listeria after the company. Obviously a poorly thought out marketing strategy because you don't really want a, a food company naming like poisonous food bacteria. Anyway, the QA got to name it. So her last name is now the name of that particular very unusual strain of listeria that is now covered by Listex. So uh, yes, it covers all strains and in the very unusual circumstance where it's not globally, they'll find it and incorporate it into the next batch. Um, there's no traditional um, trade-off between quality and safety. The food quality remains identical. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's organic, it's halal, it's kosher, it's tasteless, it's odorless, it's colorless. Um, it's not harmful to humans, animals or plant or machinery, nothing like that. Uh, there's no safety issues, you don't need any PPE. In fact, at a, uh, a real, remember when we could have those trade shows and we could actually see each other? I was at one of those doing a presentation that some of you might have even been at at one stage. Um, it wasn't the one at the showgrounds, it was another one in the city. Um, I actually drank half a bottle of Salmonella Phage Guard mixed with uh, half a glass of water in a wine glass. And um, I did that without asking anyone and they, at, at, at the lab, and they said, well, of course, it, it, it's not gonna harm you. But they told me that if I had have had a significant Salmonella infection, like just, if I had a health issue and I was infected by Salmonella, the fact that it killed all of the Salmonella in my system immediately could have been bad because of the waste products of the breakdown of a lot of Salmonella. But, um, so I'm not recommending to drink it, but um, because I didn't have Salmonella poisoning, and like uh, it didn't have any effect. So 100% safe to drink. And that was in, I, I literally drunk six, six trillion phages in like a glass of water and it had no effect. Um, it's not corrosive and um, it's, it's, it's essentially an insurance policy. Um, it's used on a wide variety of foods. It's used a lot in soft cheeses. Um, it's used a lot in any, any high care environment. And if you look here on the screen, you'll see um, how many of these are dairy. One, two, three, four. Four of these are dairy and then the rest are small goods, basically, oh, and salmon. And that's pretty much where it gets used globally around the world. Soft cheeses, synonymous with um, listeria. This particular machine in the middle, it's um, a machine that turns soft cheeses as part of the production process. And of course, it was transmitting listeria around the plant. So there's just a little tiny spray, a mist of spray that whenever it, it opens its jaws, it sprays this little tiny mist of phage guard L onto the production equipment. And that just prevents any listeria getting around and being shared because no one wants to share that much. Um, this has got some general uh, efficacy type data. There's actually a data sheet for the dairy industry that I, um, included with the email that I sent out to Jennifer. So hopefully um, she'll be able to pass that on to you. Uh, obviously if you contact us, we'll give you all the information, but um, I'm not gonna read through every little piece of data. It's, it's starting to get a little bit more data intensive going forward this uh, seminar. It's getting a bit more specific. Um, here you can see, um, you know, some scientific data on, uh, on, on, on what I, actually it does um, in terms of the log count reductions and the quality forming unit reductions and all that sort of stuff. This doesn't really bode well uh, for like a webinar and definitely not my style. I'm not actually a scientist. I'm a business person that discovered this product and went, oh, this could be useful in the food manufacturing industry and then um, worked with the manufacturers to commercialize it because essentially they were excellent academics and uh, well, I'm more commercial than they were. Uh, so that's why it's commercially available now. Uh, so continuing on, um, it does need coverage. So it doesn't move around. It's, the phage isn't gonna spy a bacteria on the other side of the production equipment and just climb over to, to infect it. So the way we um, 
validate coverage is by using food dye. Um, so if we're if we're confident that the the, the, the product's being covered, then um, it works. It's it also works in a similar way to um, human populations in terms of herd immunity. So if you get enough coverage of enough product, there's just not going to be transmission of listeria amongst it. So you might get one corn cob with one or two pieces of listeria on it, um, escaping being covered, but it just means that your product in general is listeria free. And it's going to, it's going to be mixed in and going to come in contact with that phage pretty, pretty certainly. There's all sorts of jets and nozzles that we use. Um, I know none of you make hot dogs, but you could imagine this on a production line uh, for, for cheeses or for some other dairy product uh, being sprayed under the lid of some sort of biodynamic yogurt or something like that. Um, literally just little sprays, we can very tiny doses. We work with uh, spray jet, spray bar, someone, I can't remember the, the words spray and bar are definitely involved. And we work with them around Australia and they, um, they, uh, they make great equipment to, to get this sorted. Um, there's just some pictures of hot dogs. Why am I showing that? Oh, because it's got a little spray thing up there. It's just spraying it on the hot dogs, very exciting. Um, this is what we're doing a lot more now. We're just spraying it into the package before sealing or vacuum sealing. This has obviously you know, got a, a, like a red meat muscle product there, but um, it could easily be a dairy product. It's exactly the same process. I'm sure you've, you guys have all seen uh, vacuum pack seals and all that sort of stuff. And if we can just find a little place to spray it in, obviously there's moisture inside and it, it moves around inside that um, and just guards it. Literally other hygiene and cleaning companies can maybe get your factory clean. Maybe, maybe they can do a bacterial level clean. Maybe they can even keep your, your product clean. We, we actually stay on the products through the retailer into the consumer's fridge. We stay on the fork of the consumer and we go down into the consumer's stomach and we are eliminated. Our job is finally done when our product is eliminated by the stomach acid of the human being. That's when we're done, which is a lot more hygiene maintenance than the average like guy with a mop. So um, definitely, hopefully, anyway. Um, this is just more ways to use it. This is just equipment, little spray jet nozzles all over the place. Uh, what have we got here? Got some pizzas. There's some cheese on the pizzas. There's a bit of a dairy connection. Okay. Uh, so biofilms are the, the, the big bad guy, right? I'll just check on the time. We're good. Yeah. Uh, the, the biofilms are what, imagine it's like a little party of bacteria and they put up a tent and that tent protect, protects them from normal cleaning chemicals. So our quaternary ammoniums bounce off it. The only way to get to them is to acid etch them, which puts like a matte finish on your machinery. And if it's not polished, which is what we do when we do an acid etch, um, then the acid etch actually creates the perfect surface to be recolonized by bacteria and bacterial films. So biofilms and how they work. Oop, skipped it. Um, yeah, so this is just some more data. I'm not going to read it. Um, it penetrates biofilms and then goes through a lytic cycle. This is probably the only place where we really do use the lytic cycle of the of the back, uh, of the of the virus. Um, sorry, phage. Um, it's when we get them to penetrate a bacterial film. So we just send one phage onto a bacterial film, and then they populate underneath the bacterial film and kill the whole bacterial film. And they might go through that lytic cycle 10 or 15 times before that bacterial film's dead. And then once it's dead, um, yeah, it doesn't exist anymore. Here's some more data. Once again, data is much better. I would, I'm much more confident when people are reading the original um, academic studies and the, um, and the, like the, the original journals. Like this one comes from the Journal of Food Protection 2014. I'm not going to read the names. Obviously, that's a respectable source of scientific information, whereas, you know, like a webinar from Dan, not so much. But I, hopefully, I can connect you with this, and you can have a look at it further. You can just see um, the uh, the different log counts in reduction. Look at milk. Obviously, that's topical here. Um, it really just knocks it out. So we use the quats. That's what we use in our general cleans of food manufacturing plants around Australia, and. Um, Obviously, they do a reasonable job, but phage guard is just so much more powerful. And it's more predictable as well. 
Okay. Um, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to give you an anecdote based around um, one of the plants that I was in in um, in Zurich. They were making cheese in this plant, and uh, they had such a bad bacterial infection of listeria that um, they had to stop production. And upon further investigation, they discovered that the listeria had taken up residence in a particular type of concrete that the floor was made out of that had uh, pockets inside the concrete. It had been laid as an environmentally friendly concrete. So it was sort of light and airy, the concrete, and was a perfect host for listeria. Um, so their cleaning regime included removing all of the product out of the factory, removing all of the machinery, then removing the factory shell, and then removing the concrete slab which is quite a significant way to clean your factory, as in removing the entire factory back to dirt and then rebuilding the whole thing. And um, when I was over there, um, our, our partners and I went over there and we said, oh, we, we think that PhageGuard could potentially go through a lytic cycle in the concrete slab. And since your facility's shut, why don't we just try it? And they thought we were going to just drill holes in it and pour it everywhere. And we said, no, the slab is now warm enough. It was during their summer to sustain a lytic cycle and it could potentially pass from one bacteria to the next. So we poured two bottles of phage guard just inside the door and we locked the door and two weeks later we came back and the whole factory, which is only about 3000 square meters, um, had been rid. So all the way to the other door, which is like 25 meters on the other side of the facility, had been cleared of listeria because the lytic cycle had just propagated through the concrete slab. So unfortunately for us, those two bottles um, retail for about, I don't know, it's like 200 bucks. And uh, yeah, so it's one of the things we have to deal with is that this product isn't like a chemical where you use it, it becomes denatured and it doesn't work anymore. This product is alive, it's a live phage virus. And <clears throat> if it finds its target, it will just get become more prolific. Okay, well, I think I'm done. Now I am going to ask questions, I believe. I'm going to remember how to do that, aren't I, Jenny? I'm gonna click more and I'm gonna click chat. Here we go. And I'm going to say hi. And no, that's all good. Just, we... uh, we've got a que couple of questions up there already. Okay, let me, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll read them. Welcome back, Jenny. Sorry I talked for so long. I, I don't usually talk like just into my computer, so I feel like I've just been rambling for the last half an hour, but there we go. <laughs> That's um, so good. Someone says later, mate. No, Got no, it. don't uh, worry. Just go down further. Okay. So Do we know if these phases can mutate during replication like other viruses? Yes, they can mutate. And um, these, um, these, uh, this was the major question that we had from uh, for Zance and the bio people in Australia who didn't want to allow them to be in Australia if that was the case. So um, viruses can mutate, but in the quantities that we're using, in the controlled environments that we're using, um, they, they're, they're considered safe by Australia's best quarantine regulators. Let me explain that a little bit further. If your plant was literally made out of listeria and we have like trillions of interactions, right? And we just keep dumping our product in and just killing listeria on mass in your facility, then there's lots of opportunities for this virus to have some sort of a mutation, right? Um, and we're talking about like extremely high log logs, right? So that would be a problem, which is why we can't sell this to say a piggery to put in their drinking water, which we continually get asked for. Can we put Phage guard S in the drinking water of a piggery because then the pigs drink it and it would go through their digestive tract, kill all the bacteria in the pig, and then kill eventually kill all the bacteria in the piggery and all of the muck in the piggery. And we would just eliminate Salmonella from the piggery. That would be correct. That was exactly what would happen. But the number of interactions and the opportunities for a mutation mean that it's considered to be. Uh, undesirable and we don't have a license to do that. So we have been licensed to specifically use it in the food industry and food production and it's been considered safe uh, for that and that's why it's got a Fizance registration um, to do it in this way. But if you want to like feed it to chickens and wipe out all the salmonella in all the eggs in all of the world by knocking out all the salmonella in the chickens through the water, which would work, 
um, we don't, it's, it's like an off label use that we're not licensed to sell for. So that's that answer. Uh, Alice Crawford has asked, hi Daniel, thank uh, for the phage guard, if you come across another different strain and further development is required, does your company cover the cost? 100%. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the chances, Alice, of there being a Crawford strain of Listeria or Salmonella are fairly high. You may not want to name it after yourself if you do find one, but uh, it's very, very unlikely that it hasn't been found. This product's used all around the world, and if we find it, it automatically gets... So basically, what would happen? Let's imagine, uh, Alice, that whatever facility you work out finds this, then you get a team of like the world's best scientists will descend on your site to literally do a large number of tests They'll find out exactly what's going on and they'll come up with a bespoke biological um, agent being phage guard, whatever the particular target bacteria is to kill that bacteria at your site and it's all at no cost. In fact, we are very thankful for that because it means that our product can be advanced. It's only happened once in Australia and it very rarely happens. In fact, they're very surprised it happened at all in Australia. I guess it's like the end of the world, world for, for, for the Dutch, where it comes from. Okay, um, hi. Uh, so I won't answer that question. Hi. Uh, for environment and drains, uh, sorry, just moving. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger. Here we go. For environment drains, how often do you need to repeat the treatment or is it one-off? So it'll kill the listeria in the drain instantly and it'll, it's, they're very virulent. They're hard working. They're not going to require repeat application, but I would imagine that you are going to reinfect those drains with other listeria that's going to live around your plant. Listeria is in the air we breathe and the water that falls from the sky. It's in low concentrations. Usually it's denatured by sunlight. Um, it gets knocked out by like the chemicals that are used to clean your facilities. But the chances of it taking hold in a drain that's not being properly sanitized or acid etched regularly um, is fairly high. So we recommend that you keep a little 100 mil bottle on the shelf and you just put, put, put 10 or 20 mils in solution and go around every now and then and just spray the drains. So it won't last forever because obviously it'll get reinfected. But if it wasn't being reinfected, then yes, it would essentially last forever. Um, uh, so next question is, thanks for the explanation. Also, do you know any phage that could target mold instead of bacteria? Yes, we do know lots of phages that target mold instead of bacteria. However, um, those particular phages uh, don't like, how should I put this? This phage is like the nuclear weapon. So you use it, it kills everything. It kills every single target bacteria. It's just amazing and it does it pretty much within milliseconds it attaches. And as soon as it's attached and inserted its DNA, even though that bacteria might take 10 or 15 minutes to die, it's going to die. So as soon as it makes contact, that bacteria is cactus. It's not going to survive. Mold, much more difficult. We've actually, and here's a thing I won't, I'll give myself 60 seconds. I'm, I'm being careful, Jenny. Um, we've developed another technology um, using UVC light, and we'll be commercializing this within the year. It's been held up a bit because of coronavirus. But um, we're basically using high wattage UVC light that doesn't come from a mercury vapor tube. We've developed our own LEDs that are more targeted for germicidal um, action. And there's no mercury and there's no uh, glass or crystal and they're much more powerful. So we can have 3000 watts on one of our fixtures and um, we'll be able to, to, to release to the food industry later in this year a essentially a floodlight that looks like a floodlight. It won't make any light because you won't be able to see the particular bandwidth and you'll be able to point it at mould and it will just kill the mould instantly. It'll also give you a really bad sunburn if you point at you and make you blind if you look at it. So um, yeah, there'll be some uh, PPE around that, but it's not like the chemicals that we usually use are particularly benign as well. Obviously, phage guard's benign. You can splash it in your eye if you really want to, but the quaternary ammoniums and things like that need to be protected. So this will not attack mould. And whilst we do know of phages that will attack mould, we're not going to be working on them because basically we'll take the surface off the mould and you have to do another application, take the surface off that. It's not worth it. There's other things that'll be better, um, better suited to that. Um, lol. Okay. 
<laughs> um, biofilm, uh, removal by phage guard, your products are for listeria and salmonella. What about other types of bacteria that create biofilms? Uh, this is a good point. Um, any other bacteria that creates a biofilm, this will do nothing for. And if your biofilms are multi-layered, this is kind of like next level detail. You might not want to know about this because it's depressing. But basically, if you have like a food spoilage bacteria XYZ mole, uh, like biofilm, and then you have a listeria biofilm, and then you have a different type of biofilm from a different bacteria and then another one, it's actually not going to penetrate the other types of bacterial biofilm if you've got them stacked on top of each other. It will only attack its particular targeted biofilm. And as I said, we're working on other, other products, but, they, but they're not available on the market yet. It will only attack the biofilm of the particular targeted um, product, uh, sorry, particular targeted bacteria. And this is where I have to say, I run a company that employs thousands of people that clean food manufacturing plants. And if you've got multi-level biofilms to the point where it might even feel a bit slimy when you touch it, you got more issues than needing phage guard. You actually need to have a properly thought out and implemented hygiene regime in your food manufacturing facility. Because if you've got to the level where you're getting multiple piles up of your of, of uh, bacterial films, you need to be looking at your sanitizing regime using brake sanitizers and that's a whole bunch of other stuff. So no, it won't crack through other bacteria to, um, to, to interact with the biofilms in that way. How would this product work with a product such as cream in heat sealed packages? So the heat sealed package, um, if, the, if, the, um, if the packaging heats the surface of the product, to the, to the point where it's outside of the range of, if, if we're talking about cream, I think we're probably talking about listeria, right? Outside of listeria, then it will affect it. But I don't think you'd want to do that with cream because you'd probably be burning the cream, right? So that the heat from the package might kill an amount of the, of the phage guard L um, if it comes in contact with it because it'll take it outside of its like happy range. But um, you're talking about, if you're talking about a little tiny spray, you're talking about billions of them going in there. So you can kill a couple of million with your little like heat packaging and it'll just be fine. But if you're heating it up and cooking it or something like that, it'll die in the same way that it's host bacteria. Because they evolve together and they live together. And we've only just sort of selected them. We haven't actually created them. We just found them in the environment, got the specific one and sort of trained it. Sort of like humans didn't inv invent um, like German shepherds, but we kind of, did, it's the same type of way, right? So um, if a listeria can survive, the phage guard can survive. And and that's different for a listeria phage to a salmonella phage because they have different like happy places. So um, if you've got a problem, our solution can go with the problem is what I'm saying. And if, 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 if your packaging solution kills the listeria, then you don't have a problem anyway. So you don't even need our product. Um, can you use this product in dry areas? Uh, when this product dries out, it stops working, it denatures. It can activate again under a lower titer or a lower concentration once it becomes like the moisture is reintroduced, but it doesn't like being dried out, desiccated, and then, then rehydrated. So it can work in a dry area, but why would you have listeria in a dry area? Listeria itself will die if everything's dried out. So, uh, and the same with um, Salmonella um, phage guard can much more readily um, survive in a dry area and it will reactivate when it becomes moist again. But no, it does come in a liquid solution and it's not designed for dry areas. Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can move quickly through this. Um, biofilms, heat silk package, dry areas, please provide immediate and honest feedback on this webinar. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, do you see any sensory issues with applying your phage guard pack for cheese products, extra moisture in the pack. Have you tried applying your product earlier in the process during maturation? Yes, absolutely dur during maturation. Um, we recommend getting the product, uh, sorry, getting the, your log counts down as soon as possible. You can actually put these phages in with your maturation. And whilst you have, I understand many of you who are making cheese, and this is a cheese related question, your big enemy is phages, right? Because they come in and they kill your culture and then you don't have cheese, you just have goo, I assume. I don't make cheese, but I know it's bad when that happens, right? So 
but our phages, they're not going to affect your other non-targeted bacteria, the, the ones that you want to keep happy. They'll only attack their target. So you can actually put them in in any phase of the product as long as it's within the range of happiness of um, the target bacteria and it'll work and it won't have any cross issues with anything else. It won't interact with non-target species and it won't interact with the phages that you don't want in your product. It won't have anything to do with them. So you can put it on early or you can put it on late. Sometimes if you're doing a, if you're doing a soft cheese, spraying a little bit in the packet before it gets sealed, that works really well because you're not going to really notice like, you know, like a soft cheese, like a little bit more moisture. Um, but yeah, obviously if that's a problem, then use it earlier and which, which would recommend anyway, if it's possible. Um, thanks, Dan. Is there a possibility of bacterial strain evolve and develop resistance against Listex over a period of use? Yes. Um, the, um, the, uh, the product is uh, susceptible to, um, uh, sorry, the product is susceptible to, sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired here. It's actually been really busy at work recently. <laughs> um, uh, resistance. It's, 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 it is susceptible to resistance. And what that means is that if you keep using it badly, then we'll probably ask you to stop using it. Like think about how many people use like penicillin, right? And we're still using it because even though it's susceptible to resistance, it's still used, right? Um, whilst penicillin is obviously a bacteria and we're talking about a virus, um, this is susceptible to resistance. However, if you kill all of the bacteria, the target of bacteria, then they never survive to have resistance and have to have a lot of them surviving in a lot of places and they need to spread. And that's not necessarily the way this usually works. So we have seen no resistance forming. This product's existed for about seven years in other places, in other forms, and there's been various academic papers on it, which are all available on the PhageGuard website. And you can just track what's happening with resistance, but we're not sitting still either. So our phages are continually developed and continually um, uh, sort of improved. So any resistance is generally overcome because we're continually updating the phage, which is part of our Fazanth registration, by the way. We don't have to get re-registered every time we update our phage guard, our particular phage. Um, yeah, we can continually combat that. And we're not, we're not losing the battle. We're very much winning the battle when it comes to resistance. Um, right, Dan, I'll give you a break for a second and I'll just do the next bit, um, but you might like to add something to it. Um, now, we have been chatting with Dan, Ian and I about um, another webinar in the next week, hopefully the next week, maybe two, but Dan um, in SaniClean uh, are developing both preventative and reactive training courses for COVID-19 cases. So. We're still liaising with Dan on doing this, but please all be ready for an additional webinar invitation that you hadn't already expected. And also anyone who has joined today whose email I haven't got, you can send your email through to me so you make sure you receive that. Yeah, that's you great. Go, yeah, thank you for that little plug. Um, so what, what really what we're saying is that we've got digital training, very, very detailed digital training on how anyone, and we're only targeting it on the food industry, can do a preventative clean for COVID-19. This is obviously not about phages anymore, about convent, uh, preventative clean for COVID-19. And we're happy to give that to everyone for free. So you can get that link and you can, um, you can pass this on to anyone you'd like and um, they will be able to train their staff using our digital link. We don't need to capture your details or anything like that. You can just use it for free and it'll show you all the PPE and all the procedures that's required to keep your facility COVID-19 free to the best of anyone's ability, obviously. And then there's another training program that is the reactive training program. So it's multiple full motion, high definition videos. We will talk your people through. So this could be your current hygiene team. This could be your like head office team themselves. This could be your maintenance people. This could be anyone. I would recommend not production people, but um, anyone you can find, they can be put through this particular training regime and then they can actually do a reactive clean if someone in your facility at a workstation or anywhere else has um, come in contact with COVID-19 has become infected themselves. So it's a how to recover 
the operation of that facility after someone's been there who has got COVID-19. We're not going to make a single cent out of this. If you never become our customer, that's fine. We're going to give it away for free. I'm not interested in making money out of a pandemic. I just would like to be able to give this. We're using it internally. So we're not obviously moving people around sites to do cleans, but we're using it to train our staff to clean the sites they work on should this happen. And we're already using the, the, um, the preventative one. So we'll make it free, our internal procedures to everyone. So whilst there'll be the digital training, there'll also be detailed uh, written documentation that will show the exact procedures that are being used and every piece of PP that's required. We'll make them all for free in an upcoming webinar. Um, we encourage you and anyone else you can find to get on board. It'll be shorter than this one and it'll be really specifically focused on how to protect your company and the people that you work with and then how to recover your business if someone is infected. So okay, that's coming great. Up. Okay, so we've got another question there from Max. Um, how okay. Is yeah. Where's that? I've got. How is the phage impact impacted by pH? How long would it survive in an acid environment, e.g., with a pH of less than 4.5? Not long. And, well, first of all, heavily impacted and not long. Um, however, um, you're also not going to get um, Listeria or Salmonella surviving in those environments very long either. So if there's if your product or whatever that obviously I don't know the exact situation you're talking about, um, but I can tell you that if your product is uneven and there's some parts of it with that sort of pH and there's some parts of it that don't, and you might get some bacteria surviving in parts of it that don't have that pH, then our phage will survive in those little pockets and attack those particular bacteria. But Generally, the way to think about this in terms of where will it work is anywhere that the virus, sorry, that the bacteria, so salmonella or fate or listeria work and survive, anywhere your enemies are, this particular product will survive in that same environment. Because they evolved over billions of years together, they literally share the same range of habitat. So if, it, if your enemy can survive there, this solution can survive there. And that's, we didn't, we didn't make that up. That was just like, that's why it's called power of nature because we're just using, we're using that functionality. Yeah. Okay. A little pat on the back for you there. Really excellent webinar here, Dan, and generous offer of the training resources. Thanks. Can I just say that's one other thing? If you go to YouTube and look at Kurtz art, I don't have the link here. I can send it through later or something. Um, there's a really great full motion video of, of phages it goes for about seven minutes but if you're sitting at home working then maybe you can try that out could you Thanks, please guys. type that in dan could you please type that in okay just give me one um, second yeah. and just before we do finish this up um next week's webinar is steve flink from massey university um on factors contributing to the spore formation of thermophilic bacteria so you might like to um, register for that one as well so, oh, sorry, sorry. You're okay, Dan. That was my fault. I just launched the, uh, I'm going to put it in here, and it is the YouTube link. There we go. Oh, good. Well done. Okay. It's fun. Yep. But it's pretty so, serious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, then. So that's, um, we need to copy We're that done. now. Yep, terrific. Okay, so there don't seem to be any more questions coming through. Dan, you have just presented so much interesting information there today, and I know you're extraordinarily busy, and we really appreciate the time and effort that you've put into it. Yeah, so, and as, as an encouragement, I think that, um, that the general cleaning regimes that are out there in the food manufacturing industry are going to be really, really effective against COVID-19. And I'm concerned about like areas and offices and things that might not be cleaned as well. But I think everyone in the food industry is doing a pretty good job. And I think we're, we're going to be in good stead to maintain our food production capacity uh, through this COVID-19 situation. 